Welcome everyone. Um, it's that time. It's 4 p.m. on a Friday. The weather is frightful and it's time for us to start KSU's Research with Relevance Friday Features Show. Um, for those of you who I have not met before, my name is Phaedra Corso and I'm the Vice President for Research here at Kennesaw State. And I don't care if the weather's crummy outside because we're going to have a great show. I'm really looking forward to talking to Mario. You can see his smiling face there. Um, and this is also the last uh, episode that we're going to have for this semester. So a big cheer and hurrah for the folks behind the scenes who've put in a lot of hours to make this happen. So a big, big thank you to uh, to my staff, Joel and Tom and Heather. Um, and everybody else who keeps us on task. I really, really appreciate it. Um, the reason why we do this show, uh, just to remind you, is to highlight the great outstanding faculty that we have here at KSU. Um, and for us to stay engaged as scholars and researchers, particularly during this very challenging time of, um, of COVID where we don't get to see each other in person. And I sure hope uh, that many of you participated in our um, a Symposium of Student Scholars uh, event yesterday, which was a resounding success. Uh, we have lots of um, thank yous to our uh, Office of Undergraduate Research, including Amy Buddy, um, Sai Tian, and uh, Jennifer Harb, to name a few. Uh, the students, I, I listened to many, many of the student pres presentations. They were very well done um, and just um, talk about talk about a, a great thing that we've got going on here. It's it's our undergraduates. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And we'll have another symposium of student scholars in the spring. If you're a student who's participating right now and didn't get a chance um, to do so this semester, you have lots of opportunities in the spring. So, so a few housekeeping tips before we begin. Um, please make sure that your mics are all muted, and I, I think they are, and um, just go ahead and keep them muted until after um, after we have the video and when we open it up to Q&A. If you'd like to uh, um, pin a particular speaker, you just have to click on the three little dots by that person's name. And then finally, just to remind you, this episode is being taped, uh, recorded, and it will be made available on our YouTube page sometime over the weekend. Um, so if you want to share it with all of your friends and family who would be so interested in the work that we're doing here at KSU, we welcome you to do that. So our schedule for the next hour is that we're going to watch a video um, as as we usually do, and then I'll open it up with some questions and answers and then uh, I'll open it up with questions. Mario will provide the answers and then we'll open it up to questions for the audience. So let me go ahead and introduce you to our speaker today. So with us today is Dr. Mario Brettfeld, who is from the College of Science and Mathematics. He is an assistant professor of biology um, and he is originally from Germany. Mario spent an exchange year he, here in the United States in Colorado, where he discovered his passion for forest ecology and tree physiology, which led him to earn a PhD in biological education from the University of Northern Colorado. As a plant ecophysiologist, he studies how plants function in order to understand where they grow and how they interact with one another and the environment. He credits the KSU field station where he has established his research as a major factor in his decision to join KSU in the fall of 2019. So thank you for that, Mario. We always like to put in a plug for our field station so we can keep it alive um, and, and thriving. Um, and in fact, I do see that Michael is on today, although it is raining, so I hope he's not sitting uh, out in the rain at the field station. <laughs> no, no, I'm um, in a greenhouse. Okay, so there's <laughs> Michael's in the greenhouse, so uh, maybe we'll have some questions for him a little bit later. Um, so with that introduction, I'm going to um, mute and take off my video. And Heather, if you could please share the video. Thank you. My name is Mario Bredfeld, and I'm an assistant professor of biology in the College of Science and Mathematics. From a very early age, I've been enthralled with nature. When my friends dressed up as princesses and pirates for carnival, I would dress up as a professor of biology. 
There is so much to learn about nature, and I'm fortunate that my career enables me to explore vastly different ecosystems around the globe. I started close to home, in the coastal salt marshes of Germany and the Netherlands, where the vegetation is flooded twice daily by salt water. My first contribution to a published research project was in the dry alva grasslands of Sweden. A landscape ecologist by training, my early research revolved largely around restoration and management. After moving to the US, I became increasingly interested in forests, ranging from subalpine boreal forests of the Rocky Mountains to seasonally dry tropical forests in central Panama. It is thanks to working in these vastly different ecosystems and the positive influence of my postdoctoral advisor, Dr. Brent Ewers at the University of Wyoming that made me look for a common denominator. You see, whether your day in the field includes skiing through two meters of snow in a forest dominated by only one, maybe two tree species, or whether your work gets interrupted by howler monkeys in a tropical forest that is host to over 600 tree species. All these ecosystems and the plants in them have one thing in common. At the most fundamental level, they're functioning. Their physiology is governed by physics. It starts with the physical properties of the environment. Solar radiation, wind, temperature, humidity, soil moisture, and so on. Integrating this information with plant physiology, that is how plants function and respond to their environment, is what defines a plant ecophysiologist. Let's picture a highly simplified tree as an assembly of small tubes through which water moves from the soil into the air. How much water depends on the properties of the tubes and the pressure gradient between its ends and is summarized in a physical law first described by French engineer Henri Darcy. Plant ecophysiologists are often interested in the properties of the tubes inside a tree. We can estimate how much water is flowing through the stem by applying a short pulse of heat and measuring how the heat dissipates in the stem. We can also measure the pressure gradient from the soil moisture near the roots and leaf water status in the canopy. Using Darcy's law, we can then calculate the tree's hydraulic conductivity, in other words, the properties of the tubes. The results tell us a lot about how tightly the tree regulates water use, for example, in response to stress. Rather than empirically connecting observations, anchoring research in so-called first principles, like Darcy's law, enables us to understand processes at the most fundamental level. As a result, we gain a mechanistic understanding, for example, of ecosystem recovery after a severe bark beetle outbreak and subsequent fire in southern Wyoming. The exciting part about this approach to research is that it can be applied at many different scales, from cells to ecosystems. One of the main reasons why I joined the KSU family in 2019 was the KSU Field Station, which is an incredible resource to enable applied research on common crop plants. To get started, we began installation of a 10-meter tower with scientific instruments, measuring all important meteorological variables, radiation inputs, atmospheric and soil conditions, precipitation, and more. All these data will be freely available to anyone working at the field station. In the fall of 2020, we began setting up an interdisciplinary pilot study in collaboration with Dr. Satish Gurupatham from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at KSU and Michael Blackwell from the field station to look into thermobiological differences between organic tomatoes and those grown conventionally using fertilizer. While nutritional differences between organic and conventional tomatoes are fairly well studied, their thermal properties, that is the ability of the fruit to store and dissipate heat, have not been compared. In fact, very little research has been done in this arena. We all refrigerate our food, and for a good reason, to slow down decomposition. The thermal properties of a fruit depend on its physical and biochemical properties, which in turn depend on the environmental conditions in which it was grown. Thus, by integrating physics and physiology, our study may help to improve the shelf life of tomatoes and other produce. This is especially important given that today's food production is highly centralized with long transport times between producer and consumer. Most importantly, this project enabled over 30 students from two biology courses at KSU to engage in a semester-long real-world research project. 
highlighting the application of first principle approaches in class and research gives students a solid foundation to tackle any problem from the ground up. I hope that this is just the beginning of many such projects at the KSU Field Station. Great, thank you. Thank you for that video. Uh, very, very interesting work, Mario. Welcome. Um, lots of questions um, are bubbling up. Um, so I'll just I'm just going to start. Um, I, I, I saw in your video kind of two threads here. One is kind of your international research uh, uh, looking at forests from all over the globe and then the work that you've been doing locally um, beginning at the field station. So let's talk about the international work first. Um, I do not profess to completely understand the first principles approach, so I'm going to ask you to um, give me a little bit more detail, but maybe in the context of how a forest in one part of the world that you showed in one picture might different might differ than a forest in another part of the world, like maybe a cold in a hot climate. Right, right, exactly. So. Um, the, the first principle approach is, um, to say it in other words, uh, a first principle is basically something that you cannot derive from something else. So it's kind of foundational knowledge, just like the rate of uh, or the energy that you need to evaporate a certain amount of water and these kind of things. So they're, they're laws of physics and they apply around the globe. So we can, we can apply these certain laws, whether we are in the Arctic or whether we are in the tropics, and we can measure, you know, what's the energy coming in, for example, how much sunlight do we have? What's the temperature right there? And then we can look at the vegetation in that specific region and make predictions on how it will respond to given changes in these. But so, but when you have a tree that's in a cold climate, is it expected that you would have different number of tubes, if you will, um, that are conveying water and, and then a different temperature within the within that water or within the tree right so the the trees themselves or the vegetation overall they have all these adaptations that change how these plants interact with their environment and uh, often these changes so say the diameter of these tubes um, the individual um, they're, they're a little they're called um, the little pit membranes in between these little tubes that allow for movement across mold. So they're not independent tubes. And depending on the properties of these membranes, um, it allows for the, the tree basically to be um, more resilient to drought than if it were uh, having different properties. Uh, same goes for the diameter. So I always bring up the example for my students when you have a straw. So you sit at your favorite fast food restaurant and you try to sip up some of that fountain uh, drink. When you have a really big straw, it's going to take a lot of work to get anything up and to drink anything out of it. When you have a teeny tiny straw, you don't need to put a, a lot of suction on there and the water is going to come, but it's going to be much less water. So those are the kind of trade-offs that we can look at. And if we understand the kind of physical properties, so like you said, the differences in the morphology and in the anatomy of these plants, we can then apply these first principles and see, okay, how much water is moving through here? At which point do we think the water is going to be, the flow is going to be interrupted and so on. And I think you mentioned in the video about how um, this work is important in terms of understanding how forests come back after disasters. Would you give us a little bit more detail on that? Yeah, so uh, we're the, the research that we did in, in Wyoming in particular uh, was interesting because those forests were initially affected by the mountain pine beetle epidemic that's been ravaging over in the, the Rocky Mountain area for, uh, well, it's, it's mostly over now in, in terms of uh, the severity of it. We still have some beetle activity, but it left huge areas of trees just in a forest uh, dead uh, up to 80 90 percent of the trees are just dead in these forests and so then we talk about okay now we have these dead trees which changes the way these trees burn because they might have less moisture in them because they're no longer moving water they're all dead but they also no longer have leaves on them and needles and these needles usually provide really good fuel for fires so we know that the fire intensity and the fire behavior itself is affected by the fact that we previously had bark beetles in these forests that killed part of the trees. 
So um, that in turn, then, when we look in, okay, now we have these forests that were affected by bark beetles and they're burning now, we can measure the rate at which they burn and get an idea of a carbon dynamics. So one of the PhD students over in Wyoming, she just published a paper about, it's called pyrogenic carbon. It's the same thing as if you put some uh, fire into your fireplace and at the end you have this charcoal left over. Not all of the wood is being put into the atmosphere. Some of it stays there. And this type of coal is actually pretty hard to break down. So when you have a forest fire occurring, some of this charcoal remains in the area and this particular part of carbon, so this proportion of carbon is really difficult to be put back into the atmosphere. So to some degree, fires help us to sequester, to keep some carbon in that area as well. So, and again, all of these things are governed by physics. What is the temperature? How dry is the wood? And we can measure these things and then put these into some sort of models to get an idea of the release of carbon and how much stays in the given area. All right, I'm going to back up and talk about your PhD for a second, because when we, you and I first met, I just assumed that you were a physicist. <laughs> I'm not. Um, uh, because your training seems to be like very all over the place in terms of like you're covering lots of fields here all in, under one umbrella. So explain to me what your PhD is. And if I'm a student who might be interested in following in your footsteps, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, one of my teachers back in the day in high school always told me that those who go detours increase the knowledge of their surroundings. So I was one of those that walked qu around quite a bit and looked here and there. Um, I always knew that I wanted to do something nature related. So that was always here. But um, my degree that I got in Colorado was actually a biological education degree, which um, my research focus was heavy on the ecology and forest ecology and physiology, but I also had some classes on um, how to be a good professor, how to teach properly and these kind of things. So um, it was kind of a, I, mean, I, wanna, I don't want to say a hybrid degree, but there was some, there was some emphasis on pedagogy as well. And then uh, once I finished that, I did my postdoctorate in, with the Smithsonian in Panama. And my postdoctoral advisor uh, in the University of Wyoming, that's where the grant was partially based in, um, he is a strong proponent of this first principle approach, this physics approach, because you can't argue with physics, right? We, we always talk about, we teach our students, correlation is not causation. And the idea is that first principles, as soon as you anchor your research in these, that's physics. We no longer have this, well, you know, maybe maybe not we know this is for sure the case and so this is why now i do a lot of physics in my research good i like that correlation is not causation because in the world of public health it's the same thing and i will tell you that many of the student presentations i saw yesterday in the symposium it's really easy when you have that p value where you want it yeah. to be to think that there's causation and that's not necessarily true so um well let's let's stick with this international um part of your of your research for just one more moment and for me to ask you you know the question that i've asked a lot of researchers which is in the world of covid are you have you been able to continue this international research i'm guessing the answer is no um and, and but but is it let's assume COVID world will be different um, this time next year. Is it something that you can you will continue to pursue? Yes, so um, I'm current. I'm still talking of, of course, with um, uh, friends and colleagues over in Panama with the Smithsonian. And um, in, in particular, I've worked in an area that's called the Agua Salud area, which is um, a really interesting research area that is managed by the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And uh, they look into reforestation and into sustainable um, uh, 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 timber harvest, so tropical timbers, teak and coca bolo, like fancy tropical woods as well. And they're always looking for researchers to come over there, specifically, of course, if you bring some funding with them. Um, and so I'm still in contact. Uh, right now, we're not doing much other than talk, bounce ideas off, because, of course, travel is very restricted. But my goal is and my plan is to go back, to bring students back there, maybe even teach some tropical ecology um, that does a detour over there and uh, things like that. Um, I definitely want to keep working there because there's so much that we don't know about the tropics. 
our our knowledge of plant physiology and plant ecology is super super biased towards the northern hemisphere and towards kind of temperate areas because those are easy areas to work in they're right around the corner and you know we grew up a lot of us grew up in them and they're right here and they affect us directly versus going down to the tropics um not just is it a much more complex system in terms of you know talking about plant species we have 600 700 different species per per hectare there it's incredible so it's very difficult to work in these very moist remote environments down there but it's so rewarding so i definitely want to go back and do some work over there great and do you work with undergraduates and graduate students Yes, so uh, currently in my lab, I have two graduate students and three undergraduate students that do research and um, we're doing different projects. Uh, some of them are involved in this tomato research. Um, some of them have done some independent study. So um, specifically now with this COVID world, um, a lot of uh, data collection was put on uh, on pause, basically. So we've come up with some meta analysis. We just said, hey, there's so much data available right now. Let's just download some and see if we can make something out of it. So one of my students did some research on American chestnuts. So we contacted um, somebody from the Forest Service who has done some planting studies of hybrids. And then we downloaded some NOAA data and compared those. And so, you know, really exciting things that, that you can do even without going out to the field. What? was going on in the video with the gun that you shot up into the canopy. Yeah, that's one of those things. You always want to have something interesting in there. My wife always tells me, why aren't you studying something exciting like, you know, bugs or things that move and behave? And I just literally watch the grasses grow, right? But uh, she doesn't mean it, but it's, it's still the way. So I want to just highlight that there are some cool things we do as well. And this in particular is um, linked back to this first principle that I mentioned, which is when we try to figure out how the internal makeup of the tree is. So basically, how easy is it for water to move through the tree, which tells us a lot about uh, resilience to drought and these kind of things. Um, one thing we need is we need to take measurements at the very top of the tree, so at one end of the tubes, and at the very bottom. And the very bottom of the tree is usually what we do with soil sensors. We measure what's going on in the soil. And then when we look at the very top of the tree, we need little samples of the leaves or of the branches. And there are multiple ways of doing that. I'm not very good at climbing, so the good, um, I want to say Wyoming way is to get your shotgun out and shoot some branches down and then uh, measure the uh, pressures and the water content and these kind of things in those. Great. All right, let's switch over to the um, to the work, the work that you're doing at the field station. Um, great pictures that you shared of students that were doing some good research and, and, and also a great example of research with relevance. Um, so maybe you could um, tell us a little bit more about what your students were doing. And that, and that was this semester during during COVID, right? Yes, yes. So one of the great things about the field station, of course, is that it is outside. So there's this nice pavilion and we could we would meet underneath the pavilion outside. And uh, it's going to be a little hard, of course, in spring when it's a little colder in the beginning, but it's still doable, I think. You just, you know, get some warm clothing. But uh, yeah, we would meet out there at the field station and um, take the measurements in the greenhouse so we'd still social distance. But since the greenhouse is open on the sides, there's a lot of sunlight. It really was a great way to have a hands on experience in a time of uncertainty, in a time like this. So I was very thankful for, for that opportunity to work out at the field station. And Michael has been tremendously helpful with setting things up and uh, the logistics overall. And, and he would just meet us every time and ask if we have, have everything. So uh, it was just everything that I wanted and more, and I can't wait to, to keep working on it. But but there but you're so thank you for that plug for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's here. He knows, <laughs> um, we think Michael's great, also. So <laughs> that's very nice. Um, but the, your students are are and you are studying the difference. If I remember from the video, the difference between organic tomatoes and and conventionally grown tomatoes. What is it that you're exp you're finding, and why do we care? Right, so that's where that relevance comes in. So um, 
the the project started actually, and I have to do another shout out here to um, uh, Dr. Paula Jackson. She was the one that's uh, made me contact or or con made me connect with uh, Kevin McFall from uh, Mechanical Engineering. And uh, Kevin then ultimately contacted Satish, who's also here, Dr. Satish Gurupatham. And he then reached out to me and said, hey, uh, Mario, I've been doing research on uh, fruit on the thermal properties, and maybe we can collaborate. And this is how this all started. And the idea here is that um, the, the properties of the fruit, the thermal properties of the fruit themselves, so basically post-harvest, we're taking them off the plant, we're putting them on the shelf, and we have, on one hand, tomatoes or any fruit that were grown organically, so without adding fertilizer and pesticides and these kind of things, um, just in a kind of natural soil environment. And then those conventional ones where we do a lot of control and a lot of fertilization and adding pes uh, pesticides, herbicides, whatever you need. Um, and comparing those two in terms of, okay, how much warmth do they store? And how easy is it for them to warm up and to cool down? And all these properties play a role in terms of how fast do they deteriorate? So like I mentioned in the video, we put our things in the fridge to keep them fresh. So if we have a fruit that gets warm quickly and then stays warm for a long time, it will deteriorate quicker. So um, Satish is doing the work on measuring the, these thermal properties. So the real physics temperature-based part and my students and I were looking into how are they growing? How much water do they use? How are they photosynthesizing? Um, even soil conditions. So uh, another shout out, Dr. Matthew Weand, his uh, graduate level class was also involved in this project. And they looked into soil, they looked into photosynthesis, and we're still synthesizing all the data and looking at what the outcome is. But uh, we think we already have something exciting happening in this really early pilot and we just received some um, mentor protege funding from the College of Science and Math to set up a follow-up to this. So I'm really excited to keep working on this project. Okay, great. And thank you for talking about interdisciplinary research, which is, of course, a very important part of our roadmap. So thank you for that. Um, Satish, I'm just going to call you out. If I see that your name is in the, in the people who are participating, um, I wonder if you could say hello and tell us um, why you're interested in this research what led you what led you in this direction from your field yeah uh do, do you guys hear me mm -hmm. yes we do oh yeah so hello everyone so mm -hmm. i'm dr satish um, and uh, i have published a paper i mean i always wondered what is the difference between the organic and uh, conventional fruits from thermal science point of view because i am teaching thermal science courses and doing research in that so i have published a paper on that and uh, i wanted to take it you know further and uh, i wanted to have somebody who has better knowledge in terms of biology you know uh, because i can look at the things only from thermal science point of view then, you know, through Kevin, I met with Mario and uh, our chemistry started working out and um, we have been into that. The main goal of me from thermal science point of view is how much heat actually the fruits transfer, these fruits, um, how it is different from between the organic and the conventional ones. That is my focus. That will help me figure out the thermal system that needs to be designed to uh, to refrigerate these fruits differently you know so ultimately we want to increase the shelf life of these fruits and uh, that is where um, this uh, this knowledge comes in okay good thank you and so you're, you've started with tomatoes uh, yeah. do you have plans to move on to other fruit after this yeah yeah so in the spring semester we are going to extend this to uh, multiple plants so, um, yeah, so we are actually looking at different candidates for that. So we will soon come up with um, the right ones, you know. So we want to make sure we have short cycle of time, uh, you know, to get the results. So I'm working with uh, Dr. Mario on that. Um, and, you know, because this is my job for us to be um, always striving for external funding for our research, I hope you all are <laughs> are moving in that direction. And, and who yeah. would be interested in this research? 
I think everybody, whoever is concerned with the health, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we should know what we are uh, eating, you know. I mean, um, so I think I would say everyone. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of agree, right? <laughs> USDA. Right. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. We've, we've already looked in some funding sources and USDA has a couple of good calls that are pretty relevant. So we want to see before we go that route, we want to have some uh, compelling preliminary data. So this I, I call this study the pilot of a pilot because uh, we learned a lot about how to plant them, just the tomatoes even. Um, obviously, the field station, uh, the tomatoes are being planted there already, but there were a couple things that we did throughout the time that we would do differently next time in terms of the timing of pruning. And so uh, the next round is going to hopefully give us really clean preliminary data that we then can use, for example, for some USDA funding, which is, of course, highly relevant as well. And, you know, we talk about food distribution right now. It's mostly decentralized. We talk about uh, some farm somewhere out of the city, and then the food is being shipped into the city. So this is a very relevant field to look into the shelf life extension of this to reduce food waste and so on. Well, I have about 40 more questions that I could ask, um, and certainly not enough time to do that, but I would like to open it up to, to those who are listening in to ask your questions. Uh, feel free to either uh, raise your hand if you have that capability in the chats uh, or or send uh, send your question in chat if you don't want to ask your question in person. And while you all are in the process of writing out your questions or thinking about what questions you want to ask, I'm going to ask um, what I struggle with as a consumer is just the term organic in general because I feel like a decade ago it was a rare thing and now everything's organic or or has other labels on it and I just don't understand what it means and how does one how does how does produce well, just let's use produce and not not meat or anything like that but what gives it a label of organic well, I, I can answer this. I think I want to forward at least some of this to Michael, who knows a lot more about this. But the organic labels, um, it's one of those things where I think it depends from country to country, too. And what can now what exactly the the um, the different labels mean and what the cutoffs are, I think there are even different labels in the United States. But Michael, I think you know more about this. So I'm going to hand it over to you for this one. OK. Uh, so yeah, actually in Europe they do use a different standard. Uh, so in the United States, the USDA is the one who actually uh, designates where something is organic or not. That's a term that they actually own. Uh, but primarily it means no chemical pesticides, fungicides, or herbicides uh, in the last three years on the property that those that produce is being grown. Um, from a grower standpoint, though, we look at it as what I refer to sort of as the underground economy. We primarily focus on the health of soils because inorganic compounds are not available to plants without the biology in the soil. And so we don't use, unless we're doing it for you, Mario, uh, we don't use any chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or fungicides, or any herbicides um, on the KSU field station. Um, but we, we do use uh, organically approved things in the soil, et cetera. So, but it's, it's, as far as organic versus conventional, that is a USDA term. And it, it primarily applies to chemical pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides being used on the plants themselves. Okay, good. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we have a good question here from, from Bradley. And that question is, how has your research integrated or made use of GIS? Right, so um, that's actually a good question. I haven't done a lot in that regard. So, um, you know, I showed the map early in that video where I worked at these individual locations, but most of the research at these locations was uh, fairly localized. So similar to, uh, you know, when I worked in Panama, for example, most of my sites were within, uh, I don't know, 10 kilometers of one another. So it didn't lend itself so much to do GIS work. 
Um, at some point for the project in Wyoming, specifically looking at the post-fire regeneration and kind of getting an idea of the canopy conditions of the burned areas and really mapping exactly where the areas have burned and how, how uh, severe they have burned, we wanted to use a drone approach and fly a drone over there. Uh, we ran into, into some technical issues, to say the least. Um, to say the most, we lost the drone. So <laughs> we weren't able to finish that, but that was something that we actually had on the radar to really do a high resolution mapping of that area um, to know exactly, okay, these are the different burn intensities and uh, this is the regeneration in these uh, individual sites. So I, I can, you know, my I've never been to Panama, but I've been to areas close by, so I can imagine how easy it must be to lose a drone in an area like that. What, what, can you tell us something? What is the most exciting thing that has happened to you out in the field or <laughs> in terms of research in, ter in terms of like what you might have discovered that you weren't expecting or what you came across that you weren't expecting in research? Right. So when it comes to the most exciting thing, um, you know, that's one of those things where you ask a, a father, who's your favorite child? And there's so many things that are super exciting. So it, it goes from in Panama, like I showed in the video, you have hollow monkeys and you have other monkeys that mess with your equipment and they throw things at you. And then you look and you do research in the Rocky Mountains and you have a bald eagle circling around and you have a, a moose walking by or we're in the forests here. I have I haven't seen the the fall color change here is so beautiful and you walk out in the forest and it's just amazing. So all of them have these awe-inspiring um, moments for me for sure. When it comes to the most unexpected thing or the most um, aha effect that I had, it's actually not something that you might expect that is related to research. Um, it's more like in, in terms of my career and I think the thing that I was surprised by um, very strongly recently was the thirst of students for knowledge. So this is not my research at all, but it was once I finally got the job of, of working at a university setting and teaching and combining everything, you know, going out of that postdoctoral world and really looking and mentoring students and everything together. Um, it was amazing to me how hungry students are to learn and how hard it is to feed them and how challenging it is. So that is something that really caught me off guard and I'm, I'm excited. It's a great challenge for me, but man, there are some students that just keep coming. It's like, what about this? What about that? And there are times when I'm like, I don't know, let's just do it and see what happens. And, you know, those are the great, great times. Uh, I that's, agree. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> why something. we're in this profession. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, good. All right, keep those questions coming. We have one from Joelle and she asks a very practical question. What happens to the tomatoes after you grow them? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. And um, the, the tomatoes at the field station are grown for campus usually. So we, we use them um, at the commons. I believe right now that's mostly in halt. Um, uh, Michael, do you want to chime in on this? Sure. Yeah, we've we've always provided produce to the commons, um, but but right now, yeah, we have we scaled that back somewhat. But it's something that we are we're definitely going to pursue again in the future as soon as things sort of clear up from COVID. And also, Michael, um, from what I just heard from Mario, it would be super helpful if we had bald eagles that could fly around the field station uh, to um, provide exciting experiences for our faculty. Well, interestingly, we do have quite a good population of of hawks, and we actually used to have chickens, and that's one of the reasons we don't have chickens anymore is because the hawks were so high population at the field station, we would uh, we would lose three or four chickens per day. So that turned out to not to be such a good idea. I do miss them though; they're cute. Fair enough. Um, all right, we have another question here from Chad who asks, "How did your forestry?" forestry research lead into researching about food products like tomatoes? That's a really, really good question. And uh, <laughs> because it's, you, you think there are so, so different, such different topics and they are. Um, so there are multiple reasons for this. And I want to say number one is that 
at heart, I'm always, I'm a very applied scientist. I like to, my research, not just being curiosity driven, but make, have an impact. And it is, you know, for me, it's pretty obvious. I, I can say, okay, we need to save this ecosystem. It's, it provides services for cycling and carbon cycling, but those are often hard sells for funding. You know, it's funding for just looking at how does a forest function is fairly limited. But as soon as we put that human component in there and say, hey, food security and travel time of, of tomatoes and these kind of things, um, at that point, we, you know, a lot of funding opportunities open up. And the other thing about it is, uh, like I said, I've always wanted to get into this branch and the field station is the one that um, enables me to do this research. So I did a little bit of research on food crops in Wyoming as well. It was largely on sugar beets. Um, so that was a study we did at the greenhouses there. So that that kind of started my interest in looking at this really great setting where I have a lot of replication, I can control the watering, I can control um, my harvest and everything versus going out to the field into a forest where there's so many unknown variables. So it really it really makes a, a big difference in terms of working in this uncontrolled setting versus a controlled greenhouse environment. So uh, like you mentioned, and like I said in the video, having the field station was just for me, the selling point is, okay, this is, this is gonna finally enable me to pursue these kind of research activities. But that's a really good question because you know, it's, you would think it's, it's, listen, Mario, if your research fails, you can become the marketing person for the field station because you're really doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have the questions are just pouring in now. So <laughs> let me um, let me pay attention to my job and start going through them. The first one is for your bark beetle project. Can charcoal provide whoop, just moved on me? Can can charcoal provide any nutrients to the forest or is it that only it has been if it has been burned down into wood ash, is it only useful in the sequestering of carbon? Sorry, I need to put my glasses on. That's fine. <laughs> so that that's a good question. So the the coal or the the uh, carbon that we see often on the forest floor following fires, um, this is what we call pyrogenic carbon. So it originates from fire, and there the, we have that in gas phase, in the liquid phase, which is kind of oily, and of course in the solid phase. And they share that they're very hard to break down. So they have a long residence time. And specifically with these solid chunks of coal um, or, or char is what we call it, biochar. Um, often what happens to them is they just physically break down and percolate into the soil and stay stored for a long time. So uh, what that means is that this carbon is basically being removed and stored long time into the system which is one of those things we know we try to remove carbon from the atmosphere to kind of counter that greenhouse effect. So of course the fire releases a lot, but ultimately some of it stays and it's going to be staying for long term. So that's a good question, but uh, long answer short, it's uh, it's not available immediately as nutrients to the forest and it, it does not for a long time. And I think maybe some of your students are are paying attention to this presentation today because someone asked who is your favorite research student and I don't want you to answer that right now. You, you can answer that at another time, but um, but I do like the other question that was added, which is uh, what has been your favorite most surprising moment since you joined KSU? And I want to ask another question on top of that which is which is what is the picture behind you? Because this is a different background that I saw last time and I have no idea what it is that I'm looking at. Right, so so um, the the question that was asked about my uh, the kind of surprising moment at KSU, I think I'll just have to, unfortunately I already took, I already responded, but that is this, this thirst of the students and uh, just the students coming to me with questions after each lecture and showing me photos on their phones about things that they saw at home and questions that they had. I currently have a student who's growing their own vegetables. So for them, it was really exciting to work on this tomato project. And at the beginning of the semester, they asked me, um, I, am I going to be able to grow more produce at the end of this class? And I told them, well, if nothing else, you'll know at the end of this class why your plans failed. But I don't have a green thumb myself, so I'm not very good at growing uh, anything. But yeah, so my answer to that would be a reiteration of what I mentioned. It's just this hunger and this thirst of students for knowledge. 
Well, darn, because I just bought a Venus flytrap that I'm not able to keep alive, and I was going to ask you about that at the end, but I'll save that for another time. Tell me about what's behind you. All right, so this is the uh, kind of the background that we used for, um, I think, kind of the, the splash image for this presentation on the website as well. So on this site over here, this is actually, um, uh, I'm going to say a meteorological station. It has a couple more things. It's called an eddy flux station. So it measures atmospheric carbon and um, water concentrations, temperatures, wind, all sorts of things. And this is actually located on uh, Glacier Peak, which is a high elevation uh, peak in Wyoming. So this is above tree line, very cold environment. Uh, extremely high wind speeds. We had to ride snowmobiles up there to get up there. So very different environment from this one over here, which is an early morning in Panama when we sampled um, leaf water potential measurements before the sun rises. There are some measurements that we have to take before the plants start photosynthesizing. So this was a sunrise in Panama, very hot, very different environment. And I projected those both with these gears behind it because again, um, very different ecosystems, but both of those are confined in the framework of physics of first principles. Good. And are, are you doing um, some kind of weather stations at the field station? I thought I remember you telling me about that. Yes. Uh, so another shout out here. Um, uh, to I have to say a little disclaimer first. In the video, I, I on purpose said we started installation of, we haven't finished it yet. Um, things have been delayed, not just because of, of COVID, but also because of uh, logistical challenges with getting a concrete uh, firm out. And then uh, some pieces of the med station uh, were, um, uh, they were wrong. We had to get them reshipped from the supplier. So there were a couple issues we've had, but the goal is to install a med station at the field station that provides um, anything you want, precipitation, radiation, um, maybe even the carbon and um, so atmospheric carbon concentration. And I want to make that data available to anybody who works at the field station. So I know there are other researchers wor working there, especially I, I know a lot of um, my colleagues from EEOB are working there. And I think some of them would benefit greatly from having some data uh, on, you know, rainfall and wind speeds and, you know, having really accurate data. So. I want to make that available. I hope we get that all up and running by spring. OK, great. Um, I think this is a really good question from Julia, and, and she asked, what is the biggest ecological threat in the foreseeable future? <laughs> and and here we here we put in some ominous music. Tom. I know, and that's a loaded question. Wow. Um, I mean, I, I'd say it's still us, the humans. Uh, for sure, and and uh, things related. That's the easy and lazy answer, I would say. Um, you know, we we say that climate change often is being dubbed as as global warming or as climate change, but it's really, if you frame it differently, it's more like a global pollution epidemic. It's us polluting things. It's it's uh, plastic in rivers, it's microplastics in oceans. It's the the things that we introduce to the food chain. So it's not just the global warming that we should worry about or the global climate change because it doesn't just warm everywhere, but there are a lot of other things. So I try to refer to our impact on the planet not just as in you know we promote global climate change, but it's more global pollution epidemic that we have to counter. Um. Thank you. Um, Zane asks a good question around um, if you're if you are an undergrad and you love this field, uh, maybe they've worked with you and have really become um, enamored with with the work that you're doing, but they don't want to go to grad school because that's not for everybody for for obvious reasons. What can one do in this field without pursuing an, an education post graduate? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, you know, one of the main things you can do is ask to uh, volunteer for researchers. It's it's always a double edged sword because researchers, you know, as soon as you volunteer, you don't really sign a contract. So it sometimes they're not super reliable when you have volunteers, but um, you can you can just ask uh, certain researchers, universities and so on to just join them and help them with their research. So that's something that works specifically if you have maybe somebody on the inside already that you know. Um, forest service, specifically if you're interested in, in research in the forests, 
Uh, USDA Forest Service is a great area. They have lots of technicians positions. They have summer internships, seasonal technicians. Um, those kind of things are great opportunities to work in the field and at least get one foot through the door. And then from there you can go on. So uh, those, those are the recommendations that I would make. Thank you. Here's another one from, and if I've missed your question someone along the way, please just feel free to reach out to Mario on your own. Um, the time is going by fast and I'm trying to get to all of them in addition to getting good advice on my own raising a flytrap. So <laughs> just fly traps. but this one's from Nikki. Um, could your research help combat food deserts, i.e. helping communities understand their environment and the types of plants that could succeed there? I love that question, Nikki, especially because food deserts came up several times in the symposium yesterday. Right, so that's a, that's a very good question. And, and I like that you say helping communities understand their environment and the types of plants that could succeed there because you know we try to plant maybe the wrong things or at the wrong time of year. So the short answer is yes, for sure. Because if we understand how a plant functions, we can at that point optimize how it works and how what kind of um, yield we get out of it, for example. So uh, going back to that first principle stuff, um, just imagine you're you're an alien, you come to planet Earth and you're looking at cars and you're trying to understand how cars work. And there are so many different cars. And just by observing, you figure out that putting fuel into the car makes it go. So, you know, that's kind of how we start with our research with plants. But what we really need to do in order to optimize maybe fuel economy of cars is we need to understand um, how much energy is in the fuel and then how does each little gear, the piston, the radiator, the you know timing belt, all these things, how they work together, um, how much energy is getting lost at each of these steps? What can we do to change it? And at that point, we can build better cars. And so the idea here is that my research is exactly looking at this kind of mechanistic approach. We try to bring it down to the smallest common denominators, um, each individual piece in the car, we don't just care about, okay, you put fuel in and it runs. We want to figure out what's exactly going on in between. And at that point, we can optimize it, which then would hopefully lead to um, growing plants where they succeed better, optimizing yields, um, and these kind of things. We are almost out of time. So I want to ask you the million, literally million dollar question, which is, Mario, if I could write you a check today for a million dollars, so you, you know, let's just say unlimited funds for your research, what would you do with it? Um, I think I would extend my research to below ground um, simply because there's not much we know about it. Um, the roots of, of trees, the roots of crops, uh, the microbial communities in the soil, um, water transport, nutrient transport in the soil. It's it's hard to do these kind of things. So because the moment you start digging up, of course, around a tree, you're disturbing it already. So we need good technology to understand these kind of systems. We're talking now about tomography systems. So we use similar technology that we use to map our brains. Can we apply this to the ground? Um, so there's a lot, I think, that we need to understand below ground, and then of course, extending to the tropics, uh, getting getting research, get a research station in the tropics and um, elaborate and, and keep working in that area. Okay, good answer. I was hoping for something like world peace, but that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can add that to the list, I guess. <laughs> I'm not sure a million dollars would be enough for world, world peace. Probably. but. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mario, you are awesome. You are the reason why I'm here at KU because I'm excited to, to learn about uh, wonderful junior faculty who care about our students who are doing exciting work and who um, and who have uh, colleagues in other parts of the university outside their own college. You are um, absolutely representative of what research with relevance is all about. So I truly, truly thank you for your time. Um, for the rest of you, this is it for us. I'm ready to go home. I hope you are too. But um, I, I was hoping that we'd put this in the chat and it hasn't gone in there yet, but I wanted to let you know that we do have dates confirmed, if you will, for the spring, and they are, drum roll please, maybe Joelle's putting it in the chat, uh, February 12th 
February 26th. I know you're all writing this down quickly. March 19th, April 2nd, and April 16th. We're not having as many shows next semester as we are this semester, but we're still going to use this format. We might even do a hybrid where I'm sitting next to the person talking to them at the same time that we're video streaming to the rest of the university. Um, we're, we're oh, thank you, Joel. Just put the dates in there. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. So uh, again, thank you, Mario. Thank you to my staff on behalf of the Office of Research. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and also a wonderful holiday season, and we will see you after the break. Ciao. Everybody.